friends this morning, I was thinking and pondering to myself, uh, what would I say with my brothers and sisters in the Fijian church? And God gave me, showed me this message that maybe you or your friend have probably struggled with or you're probably struggling with today. I, probably, I certainly have struggled with this in my life. Where you have experienced some hardships, where you have experienced some difficulties, where you have experienced people who just keep on coming in after you. And you probably wondered uh, what is the response or how do I respond to this situation, to when I'm in this situation. You see the Bible is very clear and we're going to get into the word this morning. And I'm not going to take too much of your time, but we're going to get into the word and to really see what the Bible tells us about loving our enemies. I think whether you're an Adventist, whether you're a Baptist, whether you're a United Church, wherever you are, I think we all wrestle in loving our enemies. So my friends, my prayer is that the Lord may be with us this morning, that the Lord may, the Lord may be difficult to comprehend, but I pray that the love of Christ and the Spirit of Christ may soften our hearts and melt us to receive His word. In saying that, my friends, i just like to invite you to Bow your heads so that we may invite the Holy Spirit to be with us as I humbly pray, pray this moment in time. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this, your Holy Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here, to, to hear from you, and to, to hear what you have prepared for us. Lord, I pray that you may remove the distractions, you may remove the barriers, and Lord, that we may stand before the throne of grace individually so that you, Lord, you may make us whole. So Father, I thank you and ask, Lord, that this topic may be difficult in many, in many aspects. Lord, we may pray that we may, we may approach it with a humble spirit. So thank you, Father, as I humbly ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. My friends, this morning I wanted to start off with a story that I read that happened in 1942, in 1942, and this story took place and it happened during World War II. And this is one of the most famous stories that you could find in history. And this took place, this story took place at the River Choir. And Captain Ernest Gordon. He became a prisoner of war to the Japanese. And this took place in the, co in the coast of, uh, of Thailand after the fall of Singapore on February 17, 1942. You see, my friends, this story is centered around men who found hope where little was to be had and who lived their hope <coughs> in action to care for those that were around them. Some of you might say, Brother Drew, where are you going with this story? But my friends, this morning, this story touched me so much that I resonated with this story and, and I said I want to apply the principles that I find in this story in my own lives. That the challenges that may come my way, I may apply in my own life. See, my friends, this morning, the question was asked, what does it take for a man to lose his dignity? When you surrender, my friends, when you surrender in war, you are stripped of your dignity as a soldier. The conditions of this camp, as you see, this, the conditions of this camp were the worst to be experienced by any prisoner of war. My friends, if you try to escape, you will dig your own grave, and after you've dug your own grave, they will shoot you and you die. You see, Ennis, Ennis Gordon, and his allied friends, were many of thousands found in this camp along this river. 
You see, my friends, the Japanese soldiers did not seem to care about anything. They did not care about anything. Because in their minds, they believed that the nation was everything. The individual was nothing. Conformity is how they gain their sense of purpose. You see, these men were tried, killed, and tested to the very last. They saw them as cowards. The Japanese soldiers saw them as cowards because they believed that losers, if you get captured, they should kill themselves. Now Captain Gordon, he fell ill at this time. Him and his men looked so pale. I, I know the photo does not depict how really how severe pale they look, but they were so pale. And you could probably see their bones, you could probably see how skinny they were. So when he fell ill, Captain Gordon, it was surprising how it would be for any in life condition to survive. They openly discussed in his presence that it would be for long, it would be for long as he was so close to death. They eventually placed him down at the dead house, and there was a dead house. So if you fell ill and you are toward the end of your life, they will place you in this dead house and you lie there. So they placed Captain Gordon in this dead house. So Kevin Gordon requested that he goes to a quiet place so that he can have time to meditate, time to reflect on life. But you see from there several soldiers, my beloved friends, approached him with the offer to build a small little hut if the medical officers would allow him to be released to their care. You see, my friends, this was an unusual, uh, this was unusual as everyone was his own keeper. Because you were present. But we find this man showing an act of kindness towards Captain Gordon. My friends, for a long time, hate for some was the only motivation for staying alive. This is what they said, we hated the Japanese and we would willingly have killed them, torn them apart if they had fallen into our hands. But over time, even our hatred died, giving away to no black despair, they say. You see, my friends, such was the harshness of the Japanese regime that less that three years into captivity, suffering from all kinds of diseases, Gordon finally accepted the inevitability of his own impending death. You see, there was another man amongst them. <coughs> his name was Dusty Miller. I don't have an answer for that. Is this? <laughs> Dusty Miller. One of the prisoners who was nursing him, he made a cake from boiled rice, bananas, palm sugar, and lime. It became a very important symbol for him, a symbol of life, because it showed him that despite the harsh conditions that he suffered, someone out there cared for him. Someone out there cared for him. But what spurred him on, he recalls, was, was half-remembered passages from the Bible. Eventually, Gordon grew to be a man of faith, called the Christian ministry, allowing him to forgive his enemies. A miracle happened, my friends, and he survived. No one was, when once you were put in the dead house, you would not survive. But Ernest Gordon survived. 
He survived because the men that were around him cared for him. He survived because the men who were prisoners also cared for him. See, these men, my friends, these men, these were men of simple faith. It was a faith that called for love to be lived out in the daily actions towards each other through circumstances which were very tough. My friends, when you are living to die, every minute is an eternity. Days are lost, months blend into one another, and the only reality you know is the moment and the moment hangs over you like death. Yeah. Yeah. My friends, we are living for eternity. And if you live your life with hatred towards your enemy, you run the risk of missing out on eternity. My friends, Brother Ernest Gordon believed that man can experience an incredible amount of pain and suffering if he has hope. When he loses his hope, that's when he dies. He told of his officers using their money to buy goods to help him out. These men did what they could for him to survive. And gradually these men, they built a, a, a place where the spirit could dwell. Where they would care for each other's needs. The Bible tells us that where two or three are gathered in my name, he is there. This was a radical change from what had been a case of every man for himself. With these changes came renewed interest in education, with individual teaching classes based on their knowledge and experiences. There were discussion groups, theatrical groups, even an orchestra with mostly homemade instruments. Time passed by and one incident took place as they, as, as they were wounded Japanese uh, soldiers, or so, soldiers after a bombing took place in 1945. They were, they were in a shocking state, receiving no care from their own men and appeared to be waiting for death. More coward and defeated than we had ever been, Gordon says. Most of the officers in Golden Section unbuckled their packs, took out part of their rations and rag and a rag or two, and with water canteens in their hands, went over to the Japanese. God tried to prevent them, but we ignored them and knelt down by the enemy to give water and food and clean uh, to clean and bind up their wounds. Do you see the radical change that took place in their minds? These were the oppressors who were now wounded. And these soldiers, the, the ones who were oppressed, became the ones who began to help. Something took place in their lives. There was a radical change. Then one officer challenged one of the Allied officers and looked at Ernest Gordon and reminded him of the story of the Good Samaritan who went and helped the stranger who had been knocked down, robbed by thieves and left for dead. And he said, but that's different. The officer protested angrily. That's in the Bible, he says. These are the swine, he calls them, who have stopped us and beaten us. These are our enemies. Then Gordon replies with a question, Who is my enemy? Isn't he my neighbor? We had experienced a moment of grace there
there in those blood-stained well records. God had broken through the barriers of our prejudice and had given us the will to obey his command. Thou shalt love, he says. See, my friends, it was said, it was said that what will happen to the just should be, should he enter into this world. Well, a just man with a, will be scorched, rapid, rap, changed. Then after every kind of misery, he will be crucified on a pole for all to see. The same Allied soldier believed you were, you need to seek justice. He wanted blood. He wanted for he, them to suffer as they suffered. An eye for an eye, he said. But you see, Ernest Gordon, Gordon had a different perspective on life. During the, this whole time in the prison camp, one soldier and his men were planning an escape and Ernest was against the idea from the beginning. He constantly found this, this, this man opposed in everything he did because he had so much hate, because they had so much hatred in their hearts against this Japanese. He eventually planned an attack on the Japs and killed people in the process. The sad part is that he got caught and that meant that they were going to be executed in front of the whole camp. Because if you go against the Japs, the next thing is dead. His men were shot and when it came to him, Dustin Miller, that same man, another fellow prisoner, spoke to the officer and asked to be put in the soldier's place so that he could be set free. Dusty volunteered as a substitute and got crucified on a cross just because his officer wanted to remain with hatred and anger in his heart. It reminds me of a verse in the Bible. John 15, 13 says, Greater love than no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The camp was changing, my friends. The camp was changing. The prisoners were working even harder compared to when they started building the rail, railroad to India. The mood of the entire place changed because Ernest Gordon and a few men showed that which was unusual is a very harsh environment, in a very harsh environment. The miracle, my friends, on the river Kwai was no less than the creation of an alternate um, community, a tiny settlement of the kingdom of God, taking root in the least likely soil. A spiritual fellowship that somehow proved more substantial and more real than the world of death and despair are all around. To a man, the prisoners clung to the desperate hope that their lives would not end in a jungle prison in Thailand, but would resume after liberation. Back in the hills of Scotland, or on the streets of London, or wherever they called home. Yet even if it did not, they would endeavor to build a community of faith. Beauty and compassion, nourishing souls even in a place that destroyed bodies. My friends, beloved, there are many things we can learn from this story. And I would like us to look at a few things. If you read from the book of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, I'd like to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We've heard of many things happening in the past few weeks, or in the past few months, I could say. We're living in a pandemic right now. We've got restrictions all around us. We have so much that is happening all around us. But today's topic rests on loving your enemy. However, whether you hold different views, have experienced persecution, or even hold a grudge against your neighbor, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 to 42 says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him, the other also, the Bible tells us. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away the coat, let him have that cloak also. Verse 41. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, 
grown in him twenty. And verse 42. Give to him that asketh ask thee, and from him that will borrow of thee, turn not thou away. The Bible says. My friends, when we look at these verses, before we close, when we look at these few verses, Jesus begins to tell us something. He was referring to the things that were said by those that held a different position on relating to their enemies. And, that, and those that might have persecuted you at some point in time. When the Japanese soldiers broke all the laws in treating the prisoners of war as a result of their actions, the natural thing to do for the prisoners of war would have been to hurt them back. Isn't that the natural thing that we want to do? When someone hurts us, we say, I'm going to hurt them back. Come on, don't be shy now. We know for certain that an eye for an eye results in, uh, result in, uh, in bringing a bloodshed and making things even more difficult. I'm reminded of the story of Jesus in, in Luke chapter 9. Uh, in Luke chapter 9, uh, from verse 54, it says, The Samaritan village, because he was heading, heading for Jerusalem, John and James spoke and said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? Verse 55. But he turned and rebuked him and said, Ye not know what men of spirit ye are. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. The disciples and their rage began, began to use scripture to hurt others. My friends, just because people do not see things the way we do, or relate in different ways, way, in a different way does not mean we react in the way the disciples did. Jesus' response to them was an indication of his mission. An eye for an eye cannot resolve the issue, but revealing Christ to the people around us is the only way that can testify. So when we are faced with such a challenge, we need to understand that vengeance is of the Lord. God knows the right way to deal with us. When we take it upon ourselves, we might sometimes do it in a way that can destroy someone else. And when you destroy someone else, there is no more room for repentance. God knows that for our sake and for the sake of others, we need to refrain from avenging and repay evil with evil. My friends, when we look at the example of Captain Ernest Gordon, we see a life of a man who was touched by the power of the Spirit. This came about when one of the officers who lived the Christian life took care of him, Dusty Miller, and helped him to restore his health. The natural thing for him was to see that God had, an, uh, had a, a hand on his life and as a result he needed to show the same love to his prosecutors. The way in which we behave, my friends, our actions need to stand as evidence to others around us of what Christ has done for us and is doing for us. Remember, trials have a twofold effect. One is for our salvation and two is for the salvation of others. Let us keep this principle in our hearts, my friends, today. This morning you might be in a position where you have something in your heart against your fellow church member or someone in your life could be a cousin or a brother or a sister or whoever it might be. The ideology behind an eye for an eye is not that Christ possesses. Christ says uh, in the verse in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and 45 says, Ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love what? Thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, 
Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. And persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And send rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not, do not even the publican so. Be he therefore perfect. The Bible says, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. My friends, this principle is the most challenging in the Christian faith. Especially when we use self to determine our decisions and our future. The miracle of the river Kwai was an example that we as Christians need to pay attention to. There were harsh conditions, death everywhere, and hard labor on the top on top of that. The question, my beloved friends, is how could they have loved their enemies and showed compassion on them when some of them got wounded physically and mentally? My friends, the answer is right before us. The study, the study of the Bible changed their perspective of life and how to deal with the adversity and the Holy Spirit enable them to love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This was the governing principle that some of these prisoners used. The study of the Bible. My friends, if you want to know how God talks to you and I, it is about opening up His Word. If you want to find purpose in your life and direction in your life, open His Word. If you want to know what your brother is thinking or what is happening next door, study the Word and God will reveal to you. My friends, I am also reminded about something that is deeply concerning within the church. Worldwide, by the way. Not to a specific church. The difference remain, uh, differences be, uh, remain between liberal and conservatives. We've heard these phrase, phrases all the time. There's liberals and there's conservatives in the church. But I must say, should there be a distinction? No. There shouldn't be. But in reality, there is, right? We should all have a loving relationship with one another, I believe so. But we find criticism from both ends, not only one end, but from both ends. What we should do as a body of Christ, my friends, is to find ways to build each other up and have no resentment towards each other and let the truth prevail. Mm -hmm. This is having a true Christ-like behavior. This is the way truth will prevail, my friends. Mm -hmm. I have often thought to myself, my beloved friends, what is the distinction between the two factions in our church? How do we distinguish what's right and what's wrong while maintaining the right spirit? Because the issue is the right spirit, is the spirit we possess. I was challenged by a thought. How, how are your views? See that main word there? How are your views, whether you're liberal or conservative, how are your views helping you in a relationship with God? My friends, I was challenged in my understanding of what seems to be right and wrong. I had to come to the place of realizing that if my understanding was not helping my relationship with Jesus, was there a need to consider my position in relation to my attitude towards my brothers and sisters? I began to think to myself, My friends, I came to the conclusion that truth matters. But if I do not love my enemy or my brother or sister, what is that truth? What is the purpose of that truth? If it is true, let it change me so that it can change someone else. When someone comes for you, whether you are young or old, 
remember to remain with the right spirit. Allowing God to be the center of everything. My friends, we could sit here and have certain thoughts against one another because of the two, two different views, but Christ is saying to you, to you and I today, love your enemy, that ye may be the Christian of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise and on the evil and on the good, he says, and set rain on the just and on the unjust. You can only love your fellow countrymen, you cannot only love your fellow countrymen and neglect the ones that are around you. In the eyes of God, we are all equal, and God wants us to show no partiality towards one another. This morning, Christ is speaking to us in a way that challenges us and makes us uncomfortable. The issue rests, my friends, on this, my friends, in that same chapter. Matthew 5, verse 21 to 24. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, verse 22, that so whoever is, whoever, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. But whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the counsel. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell of Verse 23. Therefore, my beloved friends, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother had ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer the gift. My friends, Christ, at this moment in time, as we listen to the message, as we listen from the to this message. Christ wants to have peace in our hearts. Wants us to have peace in our hearts because by harboring thoughts in our hearts, we don't see Christ clearly. Mm -hmm. Captain Gordon could see Christ because he chose to set aside the hurt and the pain, the harsh conditions, the smell of dead soldiers around and focus on maintaining a clear conscience by doing the will of God. The reason why sometimes we continue to harbor a lot of feelings against each other is because we're not doing our part by opening the word, the canon of scripture, the, 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 the key to life, the key of the gospel. For us to be saved in the kingdom, my friends, and be exempt from hellfire, we need to be forgetting what is behind. And reaching forth unto those things which are before, pressing towards the mark for the price of the high calling of God is Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, 3, verse 13 and 14. My friends, as we conclude, a time is coming. A time is coming to this earth that we have never seen before. We're living in the time of COVID-19 today. The world is in lockdown, although we find that restrictions are slowly easing off. There is so much uncertainty all around us. But the time will come, as the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 and 21, for there will be great tribulation, the Bible says. Such has not been, been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. We cannot fathom the extent of the of this spirit in our human comprehension. But the Bible tells us that Christians will betray each other and, will, and we will all go through this devastating ordeal. How then can we love those that betray us, the Bible has? I believe that the time of preparing ourselves to experience any changes in life is now. Learn to love, my friends. 
Learn not, learn now not to allow trivial things to upset you. Learn now to forgive as Christ forgave. That when the time comes, when the time comes, your whole being is only focused on enduring the challenges that face you and trusting in the Lord to save you. The Bible is true that while we experience this and while the people of God are threatening the, threatening the powers that be by proclaiming the gospel message which we're told in Daniel 12 verse 1, we're told that at the time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch, stands watch over the sons of your people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered, the Bible says. Everyone who is found written in the book. This is the hope, my friends. This is the hope that we have and live for. Knowing that no matter how hard it gets, no matter how Satan will try to keep us down, as he has done in the past, Christ, our Redeemer, will deliver us. Amen. When we eventually reach the golden streets, the new Jerusalem, all that matters is that you have made it and that you will be in the presence of God. This will be all you have longed and waited for. This is everything to you. Trivial matters, put them aside. Hate, put them, put them, put them aside. What matters is that you want to be with your heavenly Father where there is peace. No more crime, no more death. Where there are people who are loving towards each other. This is the cry of the Lord, my friends. I did warn you that this is a very challenging topic. And I hope you still love me after this. Amen. In Revelation 7 verse 14. Revelation chapter 7 verse 14. It says, And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation. And the Bible says, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Mm. Christ's followers do not start to obey Him in heaven. But they begin the journey here on earth. Mm. Loving your neighbor as yourself, despite how many times they show their weakness in character. Christ compels you or compels us to love and to forgive. Amen. Prayer and humiliation will help us in our everyday life. This journey is tough, but it is made easy if we just humble ourselves. The thing we need to understand is that Christ made sacrifices for you and I to be the king. Amen. He was faithful to the point of death. He had many enemies who were, who were trying to kill him. But what Christ did was he showed them how to love those that persecute, prosecute, persecute you by showing kindness. Today, my friends, the only reason you and I want to develop a relationship with Difficult people is because God loves them and has put the love in our hearts and doing so saves them from God's kingdom. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 Let not corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to your hearers. Today what we have is hope and faith as we press toward the goal. In this church, this morning, we can show how much we love each other by communicating. 
You want to learn to love your dead enemy? You must learn to talk swiftly. Without communication, you cannot develop loving relationship, saving relationship. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6, my last text. Let your speech always be with grace, the Bible says. Seasoned with salt. That you may know how you ought to answer each one. Ellen White, a minister of healing, says this statement, simple statement. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is loving and lovable Christian. I want to leave you with those words this morning. As I studied this letter, this topic very heavily, it challenged me in my understanding. It challenged everything about me. Because the natural thing that I, in my own strength, is not to love. But Christ is saying, love. The way in which you love yourself, love your enemy, so that they can be in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Amen. My friends, Brother Drew loves everyone here. Amen. And I hope you love Brother Drew too. I love to receive the love too. Even if you don't, it's okay. But we will want to be in heaven, right? May the Lord add a blessing to his word. Amen. Mm -hmm.